Well, the, the title of the talk is uh, Freedom Basics, and uh, of course that freedom is a very big subject to try to squeeze into 30, 40 minutes. I'll try to leave some time for questions, but the, and the, the other thing that makes this difficult is the dinner is on the, the other side of this talk, so uh, the challenge is, uh, there's always a challenge for a speaker when the, when the meal is right afterwards, but we'll try to do the best we can. I, I, I'm not going to try to give some sort of comprehensive uh, treatise on uh, the subject of freedom. That's a very big subject, and that would be... Uh, overambitious. One good thing a speaker learns is uh, to not be too ambitious given the uh, time constraints and other, and other uh, constraints. You've got to be realistic. So I, wa I want to just hit some topics and maybe set the tone for the week in terms of freedom. Now the name of the, uh, the foundation, as you know, is the Foundation for Economic Education. The word freedom, not in that. That sounds very neutral, right? The Foundation for Economic Education. We just believe in Studying economics, doesn't matter what kind, I mean, that's what it would seem at first. Right? We're just there to promote the studying of economics. And, uh, of course, uh, that's not really what we do. That's, that, that's a very uh, sort of minimalist uh, uh, description of what it is we do. If you look through the archive of the Freeman going back to uh, the 1950s, when, when, we, when Fee acquired it and began to publish it, it bought, was purchased from somebody else, uh, you'll see that it's more than just promoting in some sort of neutral way uh, the study of economics. We have a particular view about economics. Uh, we believe uh, that there is such a discipline as economics. We believe there are economic laws, there are economic forces that operate whether we want to believe they do or not, similar to the laws of physics. You know, the law of gravity is there whether you choose to believe it or not, and if you choose to disbelieve it, reality is going to be a pretty good teacher. And, uh, and uh, in fact, it may be the last lesson you ever learn, depending on exactly how you try to violate the law. In other cases, you may just fall down and realize, oops, I better not try to do that again. Well, we think the same is true with the laws of economics. Uh, they, the consequences may not come quite as fast and acute as uh, some of the physical laws, but they do still uh, follow attempts to, to violate them, to ignore them, to pretend they're not there. Or if you've never even learned them in the first place, you'll uh, uh, sooner or later... Uh, be taught them. If, uh, and so, um, we th unlike some schools of economics, we think the, uh, there, there are economic forces and that they, uh, they work when they're allowed to work. So that already leads us into this idea of, uh, of freedom, because if we're going to let the economic forces operate, it means basically letting people uh, behave in an economic context without um, uh, interference in their activities. And you should read that to understand, uh, I mean, to, you should uh, interpret that to mean when I say not interfere with their activities, not inf interfere with their peaceful activities. And I'm going to say a little more about this, but Leonard Reed, who's the founder of this foundation uh, in 1946, and uh, he died in 1983, so he was the uh, founder and president for, uh, for quite a while, ran the foundation. Uh, his best known book had the title Anything That's Peaceful. It kind of gives you an idea what he, what he was talking about. Anything that, in his view, is creative and productive uh, should be permitted in a, in a society, in a proper human society. So when I say people should be not interfered with, I, it obviously it means their, uh, their peaceful activity should not be interfered with. Like I said, I'll say a, more, a little more about that. Uh, in fact, at some point after the foundation was in operation, Leonard Reed expressed some regret in a letter, I believe it was, to somebody about how he wished he had called the foundation this, something, I think I'm remembering this correctly, the Center for the Study of Liberty, which is pretty interesting. I think an interesting uh, thing for him to say a few years later. Uh, he, he, uh, it dawned on him that the name was not quite as descriptive as, as maybe he would have liked it. Now, you can argue whether it's good to have something that's not too descriptive, uh, or whether you want to sort of show all your hands right away. You know, you can go back and forth. I don't know whether he changed his mind another, another time. And by then the name was established, so that, you know, it wasn't going to be changed. But, but uh, if you look at fee materials over the years, you see it's not strictly technical economics in some sort of neutral sense or the promotion of, of the idea that people ought to study economics. It goes way beyond that. And you're going to learn sort of the content over the next beginning, beginning after dinner with the first lecture, the content of sort of the economic approach, the economic philosophy, not just strict economics, but the philosophy economic, of economics that we embrace. Uh, it's, uh, 
most identified with what's known as the Austrian school of economics, if, you, if anybody here already knows that uh, phrase. Uh, and you'll be learning more about that. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the economy of Austria. It just means that the thinkers who developed this approach to economics were in, in the late 19th century and then into the early 20th century were Austrians. They were at the University of Vienna or around Vienna. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, uh, Vienna uh, or Austria, that whole region, uh, in the late 19th century and then into the first couple decades of the 20th century, it was an amazing place, an amazing time. I mean, there, was a, there were advances being made in all major areas. Philosophy, science, the arts. It was quite a, quite a time. And economics was one of those areas. Economics that really um, put economics on a new, new path. It, it was a change from the earlier classical school, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Mill, Although not a repudiation of that, but more like a correction, although in very important ways, a correction of that. And um, you'll, you'll hear more about this. So I, I, don't, I actually didn't want to spend the time on economics, but I thought I should say something. I want to talk about freedom and the, uh, you know, the connection between freedom and economics should be pretty clear. Maybe it isn't, but when we, when we debate people and, and sort of discuss and argue with uh, people who don't hold the point of view that the the foundation promotes, it's, we sometimes get a little frustrated because the connection between economics and freedom uh, seems so obvious, but you, know, you never want to take anything for granted and, and uh, we want to explain it to people, but sometimes I have a hard time understanding why people don't quite see that connection right away. I mean, if you, the whole point of uh, our approach to freedom, and again, it seems sort of the sort of thing that most people ought to readily sign on to, is that free, you need freedom if you're going to make of your life what it is you want to make of it. I mean, that seems like an essential characteristic to living the sort of life you want to live. Now, notice that doesn't sound strictly like economics, does it? We're talking now about sort of broader things than just economics. Call them non-material, call it spiritual, call it whatever you want. But we're talking about now shaping your life to the extent that that's possible. Now, obviously, there are some limits on what anybody can do, but there are certainly, the limits aren't all that narrow. And the idea is that your life is important, first of all, to you. It's also important to other people, but first of all, it's to, important to you. And the idea that you should be master of it to the extent that you can be, uh, it, to, to uh, us, is very important. And you need freedom if you're to make the most of it. Which isn't to say that freedom is not an all or nothing, I mean, it obviously exists on a continuum. You can imagine a complete totalitarian society where you're monitored every single moment and can't do anything and never have a moment of, to yourself where you can determine what it is you do. And then you can imagine the other side where, um, where you have uh, the sort of thing we're talking about, where you do have the freedom. There's a lot of room in between. But to the extent you're moving to the side where the, you're unfree, that just means there's less and less scope for you to make of your life uh, what you want to make of it. <clears throat> now you're going to hear, you know, what do you call this view? I mean, you're going to hear a lot of uh, labels, I suppose, and different people have different labels. Uh, libertarian is, a, is a, a very common one. One problem with that is there's a political party by that name and, and we're not connected with it. And many libertarians are not involved in politics or connected with the party, so there's a possible some confusion there. Uh, the old original word for this view was liberal. And, uh, but today, that's, you say liberal, and people think of uh, Teddy Kennedy or uh, you know, Barack Obama, you know, somebody who's uh, for big government, wants government involved in the economy in lots of ways, and, and, uh, and we don't think of that as consistent with freedom, at least here. So, but, but liberal, of course, has the same root word, uh, root as liberty and libertarian, and it all comes from the same thing. And, goes back to the Latin and it re relates to freedom. Uh, I still think, still think that's a good word. And uh, liberals don't like to, uh, the, what we so-called modern liberals don't like to really call themselves liberals anymore because it's got something of a bad name, uh, although maybe it's making a comeback. And, we, and we, of course, we were willing to reclaim it and take it back. And, and uh, you know, I'll still use it now and then. But you've got to be watch out because it can be misunderstood. Uh, often you'll see the word classical put in front of it, classical liberal, to remind people we're not talking about Kennedy liberalism or uh, uh, you know, Obama liberalism, but uh, an earlier form of liberalism, 
it's not ideal. Classical now sounds uh, uh, quaint or antiquated, or you know, and we don't want to imply that because, in our view, it's the philosophy of the future. There might have been liberal, more or less liberal periods in the past, but uh, but in our view, uh, the the best days of liberalism lie ahead, and uh, and not behind us. Uh, you hear the word voluntarist sometime or voluntarist. It, different words have been used over over the years. Individualist that doesn't uh, quite necessarily suggest pol uh, political philosophy or economic philosophy. It may just seem like personal philosophy. Oh, I'm an individualist. I'm a nonconformist. It doesn't have to mean that, right? A person can uh, be a be a, a staunch free market person, uh, libertarian, whatever you want to call it, and yet not outwardly look like an individualist, right? You may wear whatever, basically the same kind of clothes everybody wears, and you wouldn't point them out and say, oh, there's a, there's a nonconformist, because outwardly he may not be a nonconformist at all, but yet be a very hardcore, as we say, uh, uh, libertarian. Uh, so pick the name you're comfortable with, uh, however you refer to it, or however you might refer to yourself, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, the, that's sort of a, a side issue. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about government during this week, and some people wonder... And sometimes we even get questions about this, like, why are you always complaining about the government? Why is it the government all the time you're complaining about? Well, I would hope that would be a little obvious. Uh, government is the great force that limits individual liberty in any society. Now, it's not the only force. There are street criminals and thugs and, you know, who might try to hold you up and mug you or take your wallet or something like that, which is, which is bad. But in any uh, society, for the most part, that's, that tends to be the, a, a minor side of it, okay? I mean, most of us go through our lives and uh, we're not constantly being besieged by, by street criminals. The, the big violator of liberty in history, human history, the, the big enemy of, uh, of individual freedom, has been government, the organized violation of liberty. Governments were founded in conquest. I think this is anthropologically uh, uh, confirmed. I mean, if you go back and uh, look at how uh, governments have started. They, they start with force. Uh, George Washington uh, 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 has famously said, uh, there's some dispute whether Washington actually said this, although I think there's now evidence that he did. Uh, the, the various quotation books uh, uh, used to say they can't confirm this, but this is, seems to be uh, some evidence now that Washington did say this, and you might have heard this famous quotation before, that government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. It's a fearsome servant, like fire, a fearsome servant and a terrifying master. Well, whether he said it or not, whoever said it first was on to something, I would think. I, th I think that's an indisputable thing. Let's, let's focus for a second on, on government. Uh, now, however you feel about this, that's a secondary issue. First, I just want to get sort of a, uh, an objective description. Government is unique in, in, any, in a society. In any society, by definition, it's the only organization of uh, human beings that has a, uh, a legal or legitimized, by that I mean in the eyes of basically everyone around, uh, authority to use physical force, and not only against other people who have used force. In other words, not only in defensive ways, but in offensive ways. And I mean offensive here, not in the... Uh, I could say I mean that in both senses, but I'm thinking of only the one sense. In other words, the opposite of defense. Not giving offense, but uh, although I take offense at it, but uh, uh, I, I mean here not defense. Okay? In other words, you and I can use force in self-defense, right? A mugger approaches us on the street, and, 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 and we have good reason to believe he's a mugger. He pulls out a gun and says, give me your wallet. That qualifies him. Uh, you have a right, it may, not be, it may be a stupid thing to do, but you have the right to try to repel that, that and, and use force to uh, protect yourself or protect other innocent life. Anybody can do that. So government's not unique in that way. If a policeman does that, he's not doing anything different from uh, what you and I might do. What the government can do is, is, uh, not, is use non-defensive force, offensive force against someone who himself has not initiated force. Now you may say, you know, when does it do that? Well, it does it all the time. Uh, and again, you may think, okay, that's fine. It has to do that, and I'm not, I'm not even opening up that discussion. Okay, I'm not, I'm not opening up the discussion of whether, you know, we need government. Should there be government? That's not what I want to talk about. I'm just, I trying to identify it. So when the government uh, taxes you or imposes regulations and things like that, <clears throat> it is not using defensive force, self-defense. Okay, it, there it is using offensive uh, force in order to operate, and that's. 
uh, at the very core of the nature of, uh, of the government or the state. It, can't, it wouldn't exist without it. Take away that power, and it's like anybody else. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so, governments are not eloquence, not reason, but force. Uh, founded in conquest, and if, you're, if your tastes run more to Nietzsche, uh, as he put it, the state is the coldest of cold monsters, which uh, I'm not a Nietzschean, but I kind of like that quotation. Anyway, he was a, he was a poetic uh, person. So why, do we want, why is liberty important? Is it only important so we can make money or make profit or accumulate consumer goods, lots of stuff, you know, iPods and uh, cell phones and stuff like that? Well, that's not unimportant, and we don't, wanna, we don't put that down, but it's not the only thing. It's not why we and I think most people value liberty. It's important, like I said, for in terms of autonomy, self-determination, making your life the kind of life you want it to be, however you see that. And, and that's why it's important. It's extre you know, it goes to the core. And I'll just say this quickly. I don't, it probably doesn't take a lot of elaboration, but the other side of the coin of liberty, of course, is responsibility, taking responsibility, accepting the consequences, not thinking that you can do what you like and then shove the consequences onto someone else. That's one of the great functions modern governments perform, right? You, you get the government to push the consequences of your actions onto somebody else. But, of course, that skews everything. So, in our view, liberty and responsibility have to go together because then, then, then liberty becomes a great teacher. Liberty teaches you how to conduct yourself because the consequences are yours if you conduct yourself in a, in a way that's not uh, great because you're going to basically have to reap, reap them and you learn from that. Uh, Herbert Spencer was a great uh, libertarian philosopher said once, if you, if you uh, save people, or shelter people from their folly, you'll end up uh, filling the world with fools. Because nobody's learning anything as a result of the consequences of their actions. So the two go together. And in a free society, they, they would go together. Because you can't force anybody to absorb the consequences or the costs of your actions. Right? If, I'm, if I uh, say, yeah, I, I don't need to work, what the heck? I'll, I'll find ways to get food. And uh, so I don't, you know, I don't look for a job or anything or find, get, get, acquire skills so I can uh, make an income, have, have uh, tradable uh, uh, services uh, or talents that I can uh, m uh, exchange for money. Uh, when it comes time to uh, sitting, th from sitting down for my meal, I realize I don't have any money, so wh where's the food going to come from? Well, I can go out and uh, ask people, panhandle, but if nobody wants to give me the money, you know, I'm going to learn, okay, I guess I need to actually find a way to earn income so I can eat. Because I, I can't uh, go stealing because... That's wrong, and I'll get punished for that. Uh, so, it's a t you know, reality is a teacher. All right. <clears throat> now, I want to say something about economic freedom. You, you're likely to hear the term economic freedom as we go along here, and it's it's one of those a useful uh, uh, term when we when, when we want to uh, zero in on a topic. But I want to underscore this point. Economic freedom is one is a, in a way a contrived category. There's only really freedom. Now, you know, if you look at the sort of dominant um, political philosophies in the, in the country today. Uh, just roughly to use the terms liberal now in the, in the Kennedy sense and conservatism in, in the, you know, in the sense that it's typically used. You find uh, this sort of, it'll, it'll be described as, uh, you know, this great division between the advocates of economic freedom on the one hand and the economics, and the uh, advocates of personal freedom on the other hand, and the, and the, the two sides are not totally strong on the other, on the, you know, on the other sides uh, sense of freedom. So the advocates of economic freedom may, may be in favor of certain limits on uh, of, uh, personal freedom and vice versa. So you have, say, uh, Kennedy may be a big advocate of uh, freedom of the press and, you know, so-called civil liberties, but doesn't seem to be terribly bothered by all the rules and regulations on economic freedom economic activities. And then, and vice versa, you may have uh, some conservatives who will stand up for economic freedom and, you know, for profit and business and, and uh, uh, criticize regulation and things of like that nature. But they may be, uh, what at least here we might see, is weak on certain personal freedom issues. Uh, we don't think those things can, in reality, really be carved up. Freedom is freedom. If you own your life, and if it's your right, and you could even go further and say responsibility to, to make the most of your life, uh, we don't have these artificial divisions. Uh, first of all, economic freedom is only good because uh, 
it serves sort of instrumentally your big, your larger purposes in life. I mean, there are uh, Thomas Sowell, I think, once pointed out, the economist, that there are no strictly economic values. We, you know, we talk about value in economics, but ultimately values are not economic. We only want those things because they they serve our ends, our aspirations, our dreams, right? And and so to call those economic is w is way too narrow. Okay. We're here. We're talking about again shaping your life, and for that you need some economic inputs and and, and other sorts of you know non-material things, spir spiritual values, whatever you want to call them. But they're all together. They're serving this mission you have, this project you have, which is making your life what you want it to be. So don't. I mean, like I said, you can. You, we talk about economic freedom in the sense that, okay, we're talking about, we want to talk about economics and we want to, we want to uh, study how people having freedom of action in the marketplace leads to certain events. Now, you can say, okay, so we're focusing on the economic aspects of freedom. But it's not as if economic freedom is some separate thing from other kinds of freedom, civil liberties, and because uh, that leads to all sorts of confusions and this, I think, false division of political philosophies. You know, sometimes people look at a libertarian when they don't really know what it is and they'll say, you seem confused because you borrow some stuff from the liberals and some stuff from the conservatives. You guys are confused. Well, are we the ones that are confused, or are the ones that have, or, or are they the ones that are carved up freedom into sort of separate spheres? Are they the ones that are confused? We think we're the consistent ones. We've said, yeah, you're right on this side. You want that kind of freedom, and this side's right too. You want that kind of freedom, but they go together. That's all freedom. As those aren't separate things. Free market is what you get. People are left alone. That's how I like to define it. The free market is what you get when people are left, left alone. But when, maybe when the, when the government kind of lets people behave peacefully. Uh, I think of it as, uh, you know, when you're walking down the street and you see cracks in the sidewalk and you see grass sprouting up in the cracks. That's what happens. As soon as any time in history when the government has loosened its grip, maybe it's gotten uh, distracted by something and it's, you know, it's busy looking over here and it's not watching the people, Trade suddenly begins to blossom. It happens, uh, you know, ama amazingly. It's just like suddenly out of the woodwork, people are bringing goods and services to the uh, to the marketplace and and finding mutual benefits from from uh, free exchange, voluntary exchange. They figure it out quickly. It doesn't take very long. And obviously, mankind, at the dawn of uh, uh, of its existence, uh, discovered these things that exchange leads to mutual gain, and hey, this is pretty good, let's keep doing this. This is better than fighting, because fighting, we both get poor and maybe dead, but trade, we both get rich. And, and this, is, this is, the people discover this. The economists only come along later and, say, and, and, and uh, codify or put in formal terms what people already long ago discovered just in, at the micro level, on the ground. That's, that's what we're going to study. <clears throat> So what I said also should uh, put to, uh, I think, uh, uh, to bed any uh, um, uh, thought of, uh, this, uh, about this term, uh, you probably heard the term, atomistic individualism. Sometimes our position is, is uh, parodied, it's a straw man, that we're, we're atomistic individualists. We think individuals live, live sort of uh, hermetically sealed, never influenced by other people, totally, you know, purely rational, always thinking uh, without any uh, influence from anyone else, and the ideal is every man alone, you know, fending for himself, which is totally absurd, ridiculous. If you, back in the 90s, uh, Bill Clinton at one point declared that the, uh, the era of big government was, uh, was over. He didn't really mean that, of course. Uh, but he said, he said, but this doesn't mean we're going back to the time when everybody fended for himself. Well, guess what? There was never a time when everybody fended for himself. Human beings, as the Greeks understood, are uh, political animals in the sense of living in communities, g gaining great benefits from each other, not just material benefits through trade, although that's important, but all kinds of benefits from living in close quarters with other people. We're social animals. And that was true from very early on. What f economic freedom did what, uh, uh, the, uh, was to broaden the circles of trust. Originally, people just associated, say, with a, with a tribe or a clan, small group that they had very close relationships with, and they just trusted any strange group. But what's happened with uh, as, as people discovered the gains from trade and and the division of labor and the benefits from all that, the circle of trust widened and widened, and and today can be global. You can trade with people all over. You know, we uh, you don't have to fear people around the world. We can be we're trading with them with people all over the place. 
So I don't think of atomistic individualism. I think that's a straw man. It's phony. I call it molecular individualism. We're individualists, but we're constantly dealing with other molecular uh, individualists and, uh, and, all, and all getting benefits for, uh, from this. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, in his, in great book, uh, his great book, Human Action, which you'll hear about, I'm sure, this week, uh, and one of the great Austrian economists, the one who so beautifully systematized the whole, the whole thing, uh, he pointed out that one of the things that this uh, division of labor and, uh, and this understanding that people uh, arrived at early on uh, did was to turn the struggle for consumption, which occurs in the animal world, the general animal world, animal world into a struggle rather for production. In other words, competition for, competi for, for consumption was basically replaced by competition for production. And he has a great line, oh, it's in the almost near page 700, it's one of my favorite lines in this big thick book, where he says, I'm paraphrasing but very close, he says, the fact that everybody wants shoes doesn't make it harder for me to get shoes but easier. And, and that's what separates us really from the, the, the rest of the animals. The division of labor and social cooperation which come from uh, a, a freedom, the ability to engage uh, in these activities uh, freely, uh, creates these general benefits which raises the living standards and increases the division of labor and then just brings us up to a higher level again in terms of living standards and, and social cooperation. So you would think that if we all want the same thing, that would mean a life and death struggle for it, right? We live in a world of scarcity. Never forget we live in a world of scarcity. Nevertheless, the fact that we all want, in broad categories at least, the same sorts of things, right? Clothing, shelter, food. It, instead of us fighting tooth and nail, killing each other to get a, 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 you know, part of a limited supply, cooperation actually produces a greater supply for everybody and makes it easier to get those things. That seems like a paradox at first. How is it the fact that the fact that we all want shoes makes it easier to get shoes? Well, the bigger the market, economies of scale, falling costs per unit, falling price, meaning cheaper for you to obtain the, the product, and so, the fact, if you were the only one in the world who wanted something, it would probably be very expensive because you wouldn't have any, you know, there would be no economies of scale to producing it. If there's a, a, a you know, potential clientele of one person, it's hard, it would be harder to get that. But it's, if, something, if it's something every, everybody wants, it's actually easy, easier to get it. <coughs> okay, I want to stress, and you'll be hearing about the importance of property. It's going to come up many, many times uh, in the lectures. And so I want to just say something generally about property. The, uh, the people who oppose free markets and, and our approach often want to uh, oppose human rights to property rights, as if these are at loggerheads. These are uh, clashing with each other. Human, you know, they'll say human rights, not property rights, or people over profit, things of that nature. And what, the, what I want to suggest here and uh, I think you'll see this as we go along, is you cannot, I mean, property rights are human rights. Property rights, first of all, property doesn't have rights. It's people that have rights in things. They have a prop, in fact, the, the old way they used to talk about it in the time of John Locke and a little bit after that, people had a property in something. It's not that the, this, this wasn't the property, but I had a property right in this. <clears throat> uh, Think about what life would be in the absence of personal property rights. Uh, imagine yourself living in a country where you're, you are a tenant and an employee of the state, and the, and the state was the only landlord and the only employee, and the only employer. Uh, you would be quite a bit limited. Uh, without the ability to acquire things and, ha and have, have the, the rights in those things legally recognized, your ability to shape the life you want to live would be constrained uh, to, I think, a, a substantial uh, degree. So there is not a conflict between human rights and property rights. Property rights are human rights. Uh, there are people who will claim to be very strong on, on civil liberties, and yet they don't attach very much importance to property uh, or property rights. But this, is a, this is a, doesn't make sense. Uh, Matt, you know, the, the, Soviet, the Soviet Constitution uh, I'm sure had language in, def in defending, declaring the rights of uh, freedom of speech and freedom of press. Uh, but the state owned all the lecture halls and all the printing presses. 
So what kind of freedom of press and freedom of speech do you have when the government owns all the means of speech and press? If it had, if it, if it, in order to get a press, you know, just a regular little, pr or a copy machine, they license those things, and of course they didn't license it to people they thought were enemies of the state. Well, what kind of freedom of the press is there if you need the government's permission to print something? Can't, there's no such thing. Those, those so-called civil liberties require property rights to be real. To, to to actually exist in in life rather than just sort of th some theoretical level, uh, without property, without the ability to to buy and sell, and then have that what you've acquired honestly recognized as yours, and uh, which can't just be taken away, uh, you can't have these other freedoms. They they need that to actuate those other freedoms. So this is a phone, one of these phony divisions. <clears throat> okay, now. A few more things about freedom I should point out, and I'll try to leave some time for some questions. But uh, I think there's some uh, points, these, these may seem more or less random but I, uh, or disconnected, but I think they're worth mentioning as just sort of to underpin the week's discussion. Uh, there was a, an, a great essay by a French liberal, and I, again, I'm, you know how I mean that, in the early 19th century. His name was Benjamin Constant, like he spelled it Constant. And it was, it's the title of, you can find that on the web, the title of it is The Liberty of the Ancients Versus the Liberty of the Moderns. And here he was contrasting two notions of liberty or freedom. <clears throat> he doesn't say which he thinks is superior. He's just saying, here are two notions. There's an ancient notion and there's a modern notion. The ancient notion, he said, well, I'll read, I'll read a short quotation. The liberty of the ancients consisted in an active and constant participation in collective power. In other words, being able to vote. Think of like the, uh, a democratic uh, Greek city-state where if you were a citizen, you got, you got to, uh, to vote on all important issues. Uh, they admitted as compatible with this collective freedom the complete subjection of the individual to the authority of the community. All private actions were submitted to a severe surveillance. No importance was given to individual independence, neither in relation to opinions nor to labor nor above all to religion. So freedom in the Greek city-state meant you had a right to be among, uh, involved in the deliberations and then the voting. However, once the majority voted and we had a decision, then it was your obligation, it was part of your freedom to go along with what the decision was, even down to the religion. That's what freedom meant in the ancient world, Constant was pointing out. Now he says in the modern world, and of course he's talking about the early 19th century, but this is what's you know, the way we've thought of freedom since, it doesn't just mean, that, now some people today still may mean this, but they're, meant to, they're meant, in the terms of their mentality, they are ancients, not moderns. Participation in the political system is still part of what we regard as freedom. Okay, this is the sort of democratic, republican, I don't mean that in the party sense, but I mean, you know, in the sense of uh, representation, being able to vote, stuff like that. That's part of your freedom. I mean, he's, Constant would say, if, he, if it was taken from you, you would, have, you would have lost some freedom. But that's, as he puts it, only a very small part. First of all, if you live in a great country with a big population, your one vote is not, doesn't have the same potency as somebody living in a city-state, right, in, uh, in Greece or someplace like that, uh, had. Right? Because the more people the more watered down your one vote is. Think about when you vote for president today. What, what are the chances that your vote is going to change the outcome? Okay, it's, it's almost zero. Unless you live in a very tiny town, you know, you're voting for mayor, the chances of your vote breaking a tie is pretty small. The chance of a tie is pretty small. That doesn't happen a lot. Uh, so, so that, for Constant, is not the major part of freedom. What's the major part of freedom for in the modern world, according to Constant? Quote, our freedom must consist of peaceful enjoyment and private independence. The aim of the moderns is the enjoyment of security and private pleasures. And they call liberty the guarantees accorded by institutions to these pleasures. The greater part of freedom, then, is this autonomy, this privacy. Sure, you get to go vote. But we don't vote about everything, do we? We don't vote on what religion we're going to have, and then everybody has to go along. Thank goodness. We don't vote about whole, you know, what we have to eat. Unfortunately, we're moving in the wrong direction. We have been for a long time. We do more and more have the political system deciding, you know, maybe what we can eat or, you know, smoke or whatever. But that's not really what we think of as freedom. Freedom is being able to be alone in your home and not be bothered, 
right? Just sit quietly and not have anybody bothering you. Read what you want. Think about what you want. Worship or not worship how you want. Uh, it's a very different form of freedom from the ancient notion. And yet, there are people today who, who seem, they don't realize there's this distinction, but who would have us go back to the ancient sense, the communitarians, for example, which is a, a, a lively political philosophy, at least in the campus and, 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 and even at the activist level. They think, no, the real issue of freedom is just is being able to vote on everything. But I, you know, we would say here that's not true. The less you vote on and the more you control for yourself, the more free you are. Freedom doesn't expand with how many issues we get to vote on. I would say just the opposite. Okay, we want as few things as possible. Maybe some things have to be handled that way. Fine. But I don't think we want, you know, what kind of clothes we should wear. Should be, you know, we go out and vote for that. And then, okay, we're all going to wear cloaks. You know, we're going to wear dark hoods because that's what we voted for. Or what kind of cereal we're going to eat in the morning. Or what kind of cars we're going to have. Uh, I don't, you know, we here don't see freedom in those terms. Freedom is autonomy. And, the, and that, again, doesn't mean the hermetically sealed, you know, the hermit is not the ideal, is not the, uh, uh, the liberal ideal. The hermit living alone in a, you know, or maybe with just his family in a shack somewhere in the mountains. That's not, that's not a picture of a, of a person operating in the division of labor through social cooperation. If you look through human action, you would see that the term social cooperation is probably the most common term throughout the whole book, throughout the whole 700, 800 pages. So uh, anybody who, who thinks uh, liberalism's ideal is the one man living alone, you know, up in the woods, never seeing another person, except perhaps his own little family, is, doesn't know what he's talking about. It's the division of labor, it's the great, the great society in the, in the sense of exchanges with all people, cultural exchange, material exchange, all kinds of exchanges. That's what makes life uh, rich and full. <clears throat> Okay, now Herbert Spencer famously formulated a, uh, uh, a, a notion of freedom in his book uh, Social Statics. And Herbert Spencer, is, is, he's one of the most unfairly maligned people in intellectual history. Uh, he, you hear him get bashed as a social Darwinist, uh, all kinds of uh, horrible things. And all of which are false. You can find some uh, articles about him in the Freeman if you go back and look at our archive in the, on the web. Um, Spencer, I'm not saying he was right about everything. He wrote about so much, he's bound to be wrong on some things. He wrote about biology, ethics, sociology, uh, all kinds of things. But at the core for Spencer is a, is a very sound philosophy about individuals and the evolution of society. And he saw societies moving from what he called the militant model, that's where everything's regimented and dictatorship, basically monarchy or dictatorship, where there's, there is very little freedom, you know, Society is kind of seen as an army regimentation. He saw a natural evolution uh, uh, to what he called uh, industrial society, commercial society, meaning people are free to buy or not buy, to engage in trade with people as they as they wish or or not wish. And to him, that was the ne that was the the highest stage of human uh, society, uh, human evolution. <clears throat> Uh, so his, his law of equal freedom, he called it, the law of equal freedom is this. Freedom, uh, sorry, each has freedom to do all he wills, provided that he infringes not the equal freedom of any other. Okay, f f each has freedom to do all he wills, provided that he infringes not the equal freedom of any other. Now that seems fairly straightforward, very sensible. It shouldn't even seem, seem real controversial. I mean, it, it might to some people, but... You know, sounds not bad, right? Sounds like mo what most of us could uh, sign on to. Um, and and it's, it's not a bad formulation. But if we want to do a little nitpicking with, with Spencer, it, we can do that and bring out an interesting point. This doesn't mean Spencer was wrong, but we can elaborate an interesting point by looking at this. And Murray Rothbard did this. I'm going to risk going out of range of the camera to put a name on the board so everybody can see the spelling. I like to put names up. Murray Rothbard was, of course, one of the, I don't know how many people are already familiar with the name, one of the most prolific uh, modern libertarian writers. I mean, he died in the in mid-90s, but, but um, very important in the development of the modern libertarian liberal movement. Uh, was a student of Mises and uh, carried on Austrian work in Austrian economics, but also wrote a lot about political philosophy, a lot of history. 
but and a lot of political philosophy. And in, in his book, uh, Power and uh, and the Market, which we'll ha we have some of over there, um, he takes issue with uh, Spencer's formulation. Now remember, there's two parts to Spencer's uh, law of equal freedom. Each has freedom to do all that he wills, and then there's the second part, provided that he fringes not the equal freedom of any other. Now Rothbard says, and he attributes this to, uh, um, uh, I assume, a philosopher that I hadn't heard of, uh, uh, Clara Dixon Davidson, but he attributes it to her, so I want to be fair here. He points out that the second half of that, the provided that he infringes not the equal freedom of uh, any other, is already implicit in the first half. The first half is each has freedom to do all that he wills. So Rothbard is saying that if each has freedom to do all that he wills, that already tells you that no one is infringing on the freedom of any other, right? Or else you couldn't make the first statement. So he, he prefers what he calls the law of total freedom not the law of equal freedom. That if each person has the freedom to do all that he wills, that already tells us there's a boundary around each person. Because each is free to do all that he wills. And you can't be, I can't say, well, I will to take your, your wallet. Because then you don't have the freedom to do all that you will. Because you don't have your wallet, right? So the boundary is already implied. Now, there's nothing wrong with putting in the second half as a form of emphasis, right? just to make it clear when you're explaining this to someone. But it's a, an important point, I think, as you're studying this, to keep in mind. You, we can have what we call total freedom. People, most people will say, a lot of people will say, total freedom, that's, that's chaos. That sounds like chaos. You can't have total freedom. And if you've read Hobbes, people here I'm sure have read Leviathan, some of Hobbes. In Hobbes' a State of Nature, he, he paints this picture of total freedom. He says everybody has a right to do anything, including kill people. I mean, I don't know what the word right means if... If, it, if you have the right to kill somebody else and the, the other person has the right to protect himself from being killed, but we both have the equal, these rights, he, it, to me that destroys the, the notion of rights. Uh, so we can turn the idea of total freedom to our, uh, to our in, in, you know, to, in support of our view by, by pointing out that if, if, like, if this is the society and there's total freedom, that is already telling us that you can't take somebody else's wallet, you can't hit someone else's because then we wouldn't be total freedom, would there? That, the person you're hitting over the head is not free, so we don't have total freedom. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, Spencer's great, but I think that's a point worth making. Now, sometimes you hear liberty discussed in terms of, um, and you'll hear the term ordered liberty. This, sometimes, this comes from more of a conservative uh, camp. Uh, if you read Burke, Edmund Burke, you see this idea there. If you read uh, Russell Kirk, who sort of carried on Burke's work here in the, in the United States, later, and much later, obviously. Burke was around the time of the American Revolution. You, um, you get this sense of liberty, but liberty sort of constrained, not just by the rights of other people, which is what I was talking about before, but constrained by some other things. For, here's what Burke says. Men are qualified for liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetites, in proportion as their love of justice is above their rapacity. So he's talking about when people are qualified for liberty, which implies that some people are not qualified for liberty, right? He's saying they're qualified in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains on their own appetites. It sounds like, and maybe Burke didn't exactly mean this, but it sounds like we could say to people, and I'm not talking about children now, I'm talking about adults, you're not ready for liberty. Maybe a whole society. And of course, the, the history of imperialism is, is uh, uh, advanced countries saying to less advanced countries, well, we don't really think you're ready for freedom yet. So we're going to make you a colony until we decide you're ready for it. Well, we should be suspicious of stuff like that. But Burke seems to be saying something like that. That so we can look at a group of people and say, you know what, you're not, you're, really, you're not really ready for liberty. You need to be taught. And then we'll let you know when. I want to, uh, to put in opposition to this view the view of uh, somebody you could actually call one of the godfathers of fee. He probably never, I don't think he set foot in this, no, he, sorry, he couldn't have set foot in this building. He died before fee was formed, about three years early. Albert J. Nock. A, uh, an eloquent writer, 
wrote uh, several books. He wrote a, a book on Jefferson called Mr. Jefferson. He was a great fan of Thomas Jefferson's. Not, not a big fan of the founding fathers in general, but he loved Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> uh, I think his greatest book is called Our Enemy, the State. It's worth, really worth looking at. Uh, but he wrote a very eloquent essay called On Doing the Right Thing, which I think is very nice. Now, I don't want to scare anybody, but he, in this uh, essay, he refers to himself as an anarchist. So just if this word pops out at you, don't be shocked. But he just calls himself that. So, And I, I don't feel I should uh, uh, change his words because I want to give it the quotation. But here's his point. He says the practical reason for freedom is that freedom seems to be the only condition under which any kind of substantial moral fiber can be developed. So he's putting the cart and the horse in a different order than Burke did. Burke seems to be saying, you know, once you're, you've formed your character, then you're qualified for freedom. Nock is saying freedom teaches character. People Free people learn. And it was related to what I said before, but if you're reaping the consequences, reality is a good teacher, right? Or I use that Spencer uh, quotation about uh, uh, fools and folly. But this is what he's saying. He says, the f freedom, for example, undoubtedly means freedom to drink oneself to death. The anarchist grants this at once, but at the same time he points out that it also means the freedom to say with the gravedigger in Le Miserable, I have studied... I have graduated, I never drink. It unquestionably means freedom to go without any code of morals at all, but it also means the freedom to rationalize, construct, and adhere to a code of one's own. The anarchist stresses the point invariably overlooked, that freedom to do the one without correlative freedom to do the other is impossible. And that, that just here comes in the moral education which legalism and authoritarianism with their denial of freedom can never furnish. So he's saying freedom leads to moral character. And that if you treat people as children perpetually through their lives, which say is what a uh, totalitarian state does, or even an overblown nanny state like we seem to be having more and more of, people don't develop moral character. You need freedom to develop moral character. Or as Proudhon put it, Proudhon was a French uh, uh, interesting guy. Uh, said some things that didn't seem too libertarian, but then said a lot of things that uh, did. But Proudhon, he was a colleague of Frederick Bastiat, a great hero of, uh, of the... And you, you've probably been given a copy of The Law, am I right? The great book by Bastiat. Uh, but Pr he and Proudhon both sat in the French Assembly. They were both members of the French Assembly uh, after the French Revolution. And uh, sat, both sat on the left side, by the way. We talk about right and left. Right and left came from the French Assembly. The, the right was the, the defenders of the old regime. They wanted to restore the old the monarchy. And the left were the, uh, the radicals. They didn't agree on everything, but they agreed that they didn't want the old regime brought back. And Proudhon and Bastiat sat together. They were friends, but they constantly argued. But Proudhon, to get back to Proudhon on this point, okay, ten minutes remaining, Proudhon said, liberty is not the daughter, but the mother of order. Okay, I'll repeat that. Liberty is not the daughter, but the mother of order. This is, a, what I, I think, a wedge issue between uh, the liberal view, as I'm using it now in sort of the radical sense, and a more conservative view, who would say, no, order, uh, liberty is the daughter, you know, order first, then liberty. This side says, order comes out of liberty. And we have many uh, heroes in our tradition who, who, who agree with this including ba the great Bastian. If you read the book, The Law, you will see, you will see that. Uh, I'll read uh, one more quotation, I think one more quotation, from Thomas Paine, who's my favorite of the founders. Uh, and this is out of The Rights of Man, which is a great book. <clears throat> On this very point about where does order come from? Does order come from, uh, you know, the iron hand? According to Paine in this tradition, no. Order comes from freedom. The great part of that order which reigns among mankind is not the effect of government. And, and by the way, Paine was not an anarchist, so this is not an anarchist point. He, he, he's a limited government type, but he's making a very important point. The great part of that order which reigns among mankind is not the effect of government. It has its origin in the principles of society and the natural constitution of man. It existed prior to government. Bostia had agreed with that and would exist if the formality of government was abolished. Common interest regulates their concerns and forms their law, and the laws which common usage ordains have a greater influence than the laws of government. In fine, 
government, uh, society performs for itself almost everything which is ascribed to government. He's getting at a very core point of liberalism, that society eventually, uh, sorry, society essentially runs itself. This is a key insight into the, into the liberal, you know how I'm using the word now, the liberal sense. That, that however important you may think government is, it is not the ultimate source of order. That comes from people understanding that their interests lie in mutual exchange and, um, and, the, and the customs that grow out of that, that create a certain amount of certainty in life and make getting, you know, getting through your day-to-day -day business more convenient. That's, that's where it's a bottom-up. It's an emerging thing. It's not, law is not a top-down. Governments came along later and codified laws that already existed through custom. And by codifying, sometimes they also distorted and, and perverted them. But nevertheless, the law, and Bastiat says this in the law, it preceded government. The need for law and the law itself preceded uh, governments. Governments may be efficient in, in, uh, in you know, enforcing them and making sure they're enforced, but it is not the originator of them. Okay, one more word then about the issue of, and I, uh, there's so much to say, I could say, about um, equality. The issue, we're often attacked by, uh, by the, our, our opponents, but we're not interested in equality. Well, of course, the issue is equality. What sort of equality? There's many senses of this uh, term. Uh, economic equality in the sense of everybody having the same income or everybody has having the same stuff. Uh, I think it's obvious on the face that it would require such a large amount of heavy-handed government uh, intervention that uh, freedom would have to give away completely. If, if everybody, and the, the famous example that uh, the libertarian philosopher Robert, Robert Nozick had was, uh, imagine we started with everybody having equal income uh, today. And, uh, and one of our uh, members of our society here is, uh, is Michael Jordan. He is Will Chamberlain, but that, that would, uh, most people here probably don't know who Will Chamberlain is. Uh, Michael Jordan, even he's He's been retired for a while. Shaq O'Neal, you know, some great basketball player. So imagine we live in a society where everybody starts off with the same exact amount of money. And what we realize that uh, Michael Jordan sitting over there is a great uh, basketball player, and we're all very willing to pay him money to watch him play basketball because we enjoy it. Not through any kind of a compulsion, we just enjoy it. Now, but at the end of the day, he's got more money than the rest of us because we've paid him to do something that we find very entertaining. Now, the question is, we don't have equal income now. We don't have equal wealth. Do we, what do we do? Do we, uh, the next day, redistribute the wealth all over and begin again? And if we do that, is, why would anybody produce anything if the benefits are going to be taken from you at the end of the day and then, once again, you know, all uh, uh, handed out? Uh, that won't work very well. So freedom is going to lead to inequality in this material sense. Some people are going to have more wealth, higher incomes than other people, depending on what consumers want to buy. So it's a choice. Do we want inequality and freedom in that, in that sense, or do we want uh, freedom, uh, do we want to uh, abolish freedom? What about other senses of, of equality? I'm running out of time. Uh, equality before the law and equality of liberty sound like good things, except what if we have, all have equal small amount of liberty? No good, right? What if the law is bad, but we're all equal from it, in front of it? That's no good either. What we really want is equal authority in the sense of we're, we are all equals in the sense that nobody may subordinate any other person. This is a, out of John Locke. I'm going to stop there. I, there was other stuff I wanted to cover. One hour was way too short. Uh, I bet we can squeeze in a, uh, a question or two before we have to go to dinner. We have about 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. See that? He, he, he rigged the time for me. I thought that was the absolute end. But that's all right. Yes? Well, of course, the consequences. The, 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 oh yes, so repeat the question. The, the question is uh, I, I, going back to my point about uh, how, how uh, liberty is uh, sort of a teacher of character, a moral teacher, <coughs> the knock point. Partly because the consequences teach you uh, things. If you do something that uh, 
harmful and you, you uh, experience the consequences of that, you chances are you're going to learn something from that. The question, though, is the government uh, in the area of drugs uh, imposes consequences. So is it better, if there are going to be consequences, is it better to have the consequences that the government uh, imposes through its prohibition laws rather than the consequences that you would uh, get from the drugs themselves, which may also hurt other people? So to pretty faithfully capture that. Um, as we, I was going to start off by saying that the consequences that the government imposes, of course, are not the same consequences, and this is in your question, as those from uh, perhaps using the drugs, right? Uh, drugs don't put you in jail. It's not the drugs that put you in jail. It's the government that puts you in jail, or whatever they do. <clears throat> well, that's a, that's a pretty big topic. Uh, of course, and I hope I don't shock anybody to say this, I can recommend a book if you want to look into this. Uh, Michael Beckner and I were talking about this book today. Uh, there are people who use, who use drugs, just like there are people who use alcohol, who don't ever suffer bad consequences. In other words, they learn how to use them responsibly and don't ever suffer bad consequences, including, and the people around them don't either. Um, you know, surely there are people, you're all willing to acknowledge that there are people who drink alcohol and don't get in accidents and don't neglect their families and don't lose their jobs because they don't become drunks. They just, in moderation, uh, use Drugs, uh, use uh, beer, drink beer, or drink uh, scotch, or drink uh, wine, or whatever. Um, so, why assume that the same could, thing could not be said for drugs? Uh, there's no reason to begin by assuming that. Maybe you would want to study the issue and then say, okay, after a long study, I realize it's impossible to use them responsibly, but at least that would be the, the end of, a, of some inquiry. Uh, in fact, and again, this is not a commercial for drugs. Okay, I don't use drugs. I hardly even use any alcohol. And you can ask my wife. She's over there. I hardly use any, I hardly use any legal stuff, much less li illegal. But in fact, according to the literature, there are millions of people who use drugs responsibly. Bill, Bill Bennett himself has conceded, and it's in that book, concedes that most people use illegal drugs responsibly. He was once the drug czar, right, under uh, Reagan, or was it under... George Bush the first, I forget. But he, but he points out the reason we can't legalize them is because the non -responsible, the irresponsible people would also use them if we legalize them, and that would be terrible. But he conceded that most people use them responsibly. So I, I, I think that's a partial answer to your question. It's possible to use them without the bad consequences. Second of all, first of all, uh, alcohol, which is legal, ha have uh, far worse consequences physically than most of the drugs we're talking about. I mean, it's terribly dangerous. Lots of people kill themselves with alcohol every year or get diseases. So do we want to make those illegal? And the other question is, do worse consequences come from trying to save people from the bad consequences of drugs? And I, I, I can't take time to answer that, but I will say, just read the newspapers about what's happening in Mexico and spilling over our border. That's purely a result of prohibition, not drugs. The cartels, the violence, the terrible violence in Mexico. People shoot, you know, shootouts in the streets. We could wipe that out by ending prohibition. That would go go away overnight. Anyway, we could discuss this during the week informally. Yes. I was just wondering when you talk about the needs to give this idea of this philosophy. Yes. Come across the term anarcho-capitalism. I was just wondering what you thought about. That. I think that was a term Rothbard probably originated or certainly embraced. Yeah, the question, uh, we were talking about labels, you know, what to call this philosophy. And so the question was, what, what about the term anarcho-capitalism? Well, look, if you believe in free markets and you believe we can get along without government, which some people do, you might want to call yourself an anarcho-capitalist. Fee is not, quote, an anarchist organization, okay? Leonard Reed wrote a book years ago called Government and Ideal Concept, where he set out his vision of, of limited government that all, would be just a referee, right, kept the peace. Uh, and even had some small amount of taxation. There, there's a lot of differences of opinion over this issue among people who consider themselves libertarians. So there's a huge literature on it. It's a very sophisticated literature being written from the standpoint of legal philosophy, history, political science, economics. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth studying. It's very interesting stuff. And, you know, we're not here to push one side or the other on that. Fee, like I said, is a limited government organization. That may not be my own view. We can talk privately about that. Uh, but, you know, most people, people who believe in limited government obviously would not call themselves 
uh, anarcho-capitalist. By the way, the term, you may think the term, the, the anarcho part of that is controversial. I know a lot of libertarians who think the capitalist side is controversial. Because if you look historically at what's been called capitalism, it hasn't meant free markets, but that's a whole other issue. We can take that up privately sometime. Yes? Yes. Um, such as um, society like in Iraq. Um, how I find it very complex to understand the balance between safety and freedom, especially in the complex issues of economic national security and. Uh, okay. You know, I was going to say something, and I, I ran out of time. I was going to say something on the relationship in in this tradition. This is a tradition. It goes way back. There's a heritage. It's not. It's. Uh, Can you the oh, sorry. I sorry. Thanks for the remark. The question is, what's the relation between freedom and national security? And uh, you mentioned Iraq, but did you mean like internally to Iraq or Iraq's possible relationship or threat to the United States? How did you mean that? Okay. Well, okay, this is, that's also a big topic. <laughs> which is to, to, to answer in a, just a brief answer would be very difficult. Uh, let me say in general that I was, go and I was ho hoping to reach this as my f one of my final points, uh, is the, in this tradition, which is a very rich tradition going back hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, you can find the strands of our view going back to Greece and, and then Rome and then, uh, you know, the... Uh, as Christianity is arising, all strands that then sort of come together in the modern era to form this, the view that we're presenting. There's a very strong association between this view and, and peace, and the idea of peace. In other words, this is a philosophy of peace. You can read this in, in Mises, and we put our whole volume of, uh, I think it might have been called Capitalism and Peace or something like that. This, the, for Mises and, our, and, and other people in our tradition, the roots of war or lie in government interference with freedom. Uh, so, it, in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which some people see as the, the first treatise in economics, was a brief against empire, of against colonies, how it was costly to the home country. Not only was it could be hard on the the, the colony, it could be it's also very costly and violate, violates the freedom of of the citizens of the home country. So, our, in my as I see it. Our disposition is against militarism. I mentioned Spencer's attacking militant society versus industrial society. Empire, militarism, go against the ideals we're talking about. Uh, there's a great line from Madison where he talks about how all the evils come out of war. I'm not a big Madison fan, which I can tell you about sometime. Why not? But he says, of all the enemies of true liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded. Because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. War is the parent of armies. From these proceed debts and taxes. And armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments for bringing the many under the domination of the few. No nation can preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. So, I mean, I realize this is not a very specific answer. But it's a, it's a general disposition. We, are, we would be very distrustful, we are very distrustful of the, U, of the U.S. or any country projecting its power. Defense should be defense. Anyway, we got, about a, we got one minute, so one more question, one more question. One quick question. You kept on talking about your, your presentation, the government, uh, it, it's a different term, the, the, the biggest violator of liberties and uh, uh, only unique entity that has illegal authority. Uh, but you kept on talking about the government authorized legally to use uh, force defensively and offensively. My question to you, though, is, and maybe this is more uh, so how he regards it, but government is not an entity that sort of lives by itself. It's made up of people like us, uh, in almost in every country, run by elites. So what? And usually, government is used by elites to, 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 to control power. How is he, and particularly even you, how do you relate that and come back to the idea of freedom? I mean, are we talking also that elites should not have the the sort of uh, uh, the reins of power? I mean, what, what, uh... Well, okay, you know, a lot of people here may give different answers. I'm speaking purely for myself. I mean, and, you know, even among the staff, there, could, there can be nuanced differences of detail and things like that, so I wouldn't presume to speak uh, for, for uh, anybody else. But, but I think in the broad sense... Oh, I'll repeat the question. 
We need a big sign. Repeat the question. Uh, okay, let me see if I can repeat the question. Uh, I talked about government being the biggest violator of liberty, but your question was, you said the government's made up of people, you said like us, but then you brought in the, the idea of an elite, uh, in which case it wouldn't be like us. Uh, obviously, governments are, the government is not some disembodied thing, right, entity. It's made up of people and the, and the, the people drawn from the society. I think that's absolutely true. But, and, and of course, in this society, we get to vote, so there is some input. And I sort of suggested when I was talking about Constant that the input, in a way, is very minimal, right? You get one vote in a big C, you have one drop in a big C, so it's not like you have a lot of clout. However, and, and there's also what's known in sociology as the iron law of oligarchy. In any, right, in any uh, large group, that has a goal, this is even true of, say, a bridge club, a couple of people, a relatively small group, emerges because most people are busy with their lives, right? If you were decided you were going to keep an eye on the government because you want to be an informed citizen and you're going to keep an eye on things, you'd have to give up your job. And if it was the federal government, you'd have to go to Washington and, and you'd have to become a master of several uh, disciplines, including political science and how to do, you know, ever look at, ever look at the federal budget and try to understand it? How can you be an informed citizen? So you probably, it's very difficult. You have to, like I said, you have to be independently wealthy to begin with. So an elite does emerge. And it's more or less a permanent elite. It's kind of there, even when presidents come and go, there's still this sort of establishment. I don't think that's paranoid to say that. There is sort of a more or less permanent establishment. The same kind of advisors tend to get called on. They may have a right and left wing to them. Okay, there's a little difference. But it's more nuance, emphasis. And I would say as instructive in this is the way Obama has come in now and is, is beginning to adopt the Bush administration's positions on things. I don't think that's a big coincidence. Okay? He was a big critic in the campaign, and now he's saying, okay, well, now maybe we should have preventive detention and we shouldn't release photographs. And the, council, the, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, a very establishment group, right, foreign policy group, he was on TV when uh, Obama made this change in uh, what, whether he wanted the pictures re, uh, released, because originally he said yes, then no. This guy said, and he, he wasn't being ironic or sarcastic, he said, Obama is now understanding the difference between campaigning and governing. So once you get in, you suddenly, you realize, okay, there are sort of permanent th interests that, that uh, sort of take precedent over everything else. So you may campaign as an outsider, as a maverick, you get in there, suddenly oh, I'm now responsible, I have to do things the way the last administration did. So I think there is more or less a governing elite. Now, that doesn't mean it's totally closed like in the old days with a strict caste, uh, caste system, no, because there is entry into it, you can you know, rise, there's mobility, and, and voting has some, voting and, and constituent pressure do have influences. I don't mean to say they're totally sealed off from us, but they're not totally us either. Okay, it's something between being us and being a totally separate, you know, sealed entity. I think we're running out of time. We can take, like I say, any of this stuff, we can continue either privately or discussion groups. Anyway, I thought that, I hope this uh, sort of launched things and got us all in the mood to argue and have a good time all week. So thank you and enjoy dinner. It's unopened. All right, uh, dinner is all set, so go ahead and Leave, uh, leave this room, form a line in the hallway there, there's a buffet, we'll be switching